how well our students have mastered the material, how well can we support them? You know, the interesting thing about today's press conference is I'm up here, uh, you know, yammering away, but at the end of the day, I don't need to determine whether everybody in the audience mastered everything that I said. But our teachers do. They, they don't just talk. They have to constantly assess and reflect on how well our students have learned. This is why this kind of assessment information is so critical to us, because it determines how well we are leading our kids. We also know it's a basic truism in life. What's inspected is respected. If we do want our kids to become literate and numerate, we need to know whether or not we are achieving that. And we don't do this just for ideology. We don't do this just because there's a great deal of conventional wisdom that tells us. We do this because of evidence that tells us that doing this, that rating schools publicly, that celebrating performance publicly, helps our students achieve. In fact, it has a disproportionately beneficial effect on our lowest achieving kids. The, the Texas accountability system has, in fact, been studied. And because we have an accountability system in Texas, because we set goals and hold ourselves accountable for achieving those goals, our kids do better academically immediately. Our kids do better academically in the following years. Our kids do better academically in college. Our kids make more money in their 20s because of the existence of the accountability system in Texas. There is a lot of hot sports opinions expressed about whether or not this makes sense, but the evidence tells us very clearly we do this because it is right for children. That does not make it easy. That does not make it easy to have, um, uh, because today we are celebrating high levels of achievement, but we need to be uh, honest with ourselves where th that achievement does not necessarily occur. And it is a cross that we bear in public education that this is part of our process. But the, the basic truth is expectations always matter. If we have high expectations for kids, they can rise to those expectations. And if we don't, what do they rise to? And it is important for us to have high expectations always for our children because you only get your, uh, your one shot at first grade. And if we do right by you, that sets up the rest of your life to be successful and, and to pursue whatever opportunity you wish to pursue in life. And if we have failed you in first grade, it is incumbent upon us to see that, to know that, to reflect on it, and to get better. We, we don't live in a utopia. We don't live in a world where perfection is always achieved. But we use this information to reflect on what we have accomplished and, and then decide how can we improve matters going forward. And when you think coming out of COVID, Hey, shouldn't we take the brakes off? Shouldn't we, shouldn't we no longer uh, focus on student performance given all of the disruptions of COVID? And, and the thing is, again, our kids are only in first grade once. So we either give them our best and hold ourselves accountable to that or, or else. And so we are, in fact, uh, reflecting on performance statewide, even coming out of COVID. Now, years in the industry. And so it is important for us to make adjustments. We want to set goals, and the goals should stretch us as adults. But um, to, again, when you think about the intervention framework and the other aspects of public policy that are tied to this, it is useful to, to make these kinds of adjustments. But we still need to know, and we still need to reflect on performance. So how did we perform statewide? Look, if you go to the campus of reference, we look at performance of campuses in three different ways. We look at them in terms of achievement. This is what students know and can do. This is a very Darwinian analysis. I don't care what you overcame. I don't care what you grew through. I need to know what can you do. And the reason why this is important is, as the adults in this room know, life can be awfully darn Darwinian. When you go and apply for your first job, your employer may be interested in what adversity you overcame, but your employer is definitely interested in what can you do for me today. And so we have to look at achievement of kids and where they are. But the other thing about schools is you got to recognize we are in the growth business. We take little three, four, five-year-old bundles of energy and we turn them into self-aware members of the republic. And some of them come from significantly behind others. And so we do need to concentrate on growth. We do need to celebrate how many of our kids are growing a year in a year's time, how many of our kids are growing more than a year in a year's time. So we also look at the progress of the school year over year. And while we do that for all of our kids on average, because we want our schools to perform on average for, uh, uh, in an effective way for our citizenry, we also want our schools to serve 
every individual child, every group of children. If we reflect in the, the, the where we are as a country, that there, there are certain gaps in achievement uh, in, in, by, in different gr groups of students. And so we need to make sure that we hold ourselves accountable for getting all of our children where they need to succeed. Our goal, our vision for public education is that every child can, is prepared for college, career, or the military when they graduate. Not just some children, every child. And so we hold ourselves accountable in all three ways uh, for performance. And this, again, allows us to recognize high achievement for our students. It allows us to recognize the significant impact of educators on our kids. It allows us to make sure that we stay focused on the students most in need. And this is what the results look like this year. On the graphs in front of you, you see the performance of all schools in the state of Texas in 2019, before COVID hit. And you see all performance of campuses this year, after COVID hit. And we've seen statewide a notable improvement in the number of campuses that have achieved an A rating. This is tremendous, and it is a testimony to the unbelievably uh, focused uh, and hard work of lo local teachers and principals and superintendents and school board members all over the state of Texas. This is a remarkable achievement that not every state in the country is seeing coming out of COVID. And what we learn from this is tremendous. At its core, we learn a basic truth about learning. Poverty does not equal destiny. Just because your parents happen to be low income does not prevent you from performing at an extremely high level in literacy or numeracy. This is not some in indelible trait, some indelible characteristic. If we as educators organize our efforts to support our students effectively targeted with, uh, with focus based upon the evidence, then all children can achieve at high levels, and the evidence is proof positive of this, all over the state of Texas and at Niche Elementary. This, um, this is true, and we've seen significant gains this year just in the concept of growth. The percentage of students who learn a year's worth of content in a year's time is, is at almost an unparalleled high in the state of education in Texas. And this, again, is because of a lot of very hard work at the local level from people burning the uh, midnight oil, focused policy framework in the state of Texas that is intended to, to deliver results for children, not just be seemingly popular with adults. And you think about what is anchoring these kinds of changes in Texas, because again, you do not see the kind of improvements that we have seen in Texas uh, in every other state in the country. We believe in measuring performance and in holding ourselves accountable for these goals. We have a strong, transparent uh, system of, of accountability you know, for public education. And there's a lot of states where they said, no, 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 we don't need to know where the kids are this year. Let's just, let's just call it a mulligan. But again, our kids do not get more than one shot at these grades in most cases. And so, the, um, uh, and so what, do we, what do we have to do in order to honor our commitment to them? We, have got, we send our children to school to learn how to read, write, and do math. We need to make sure that we are accomplishing that with our kids. And so we have a very strong policy framework that keeps us focused on the things that matter most. We also have made unprecedented investments in our teachers. Uh, we have, uh, at this point, almost 100,000 teachers have gone through a full years long fellowship in, in evidence-based literacy practices, learning the science of teaching reading. Because if you think that reading just comes natural to little humans, uh, you have not interacted with a whole lot of little humans. The, the, um, uh, the, the, the human mind um, acquires the benefit of literacy um, only in a specific way, there are, there are a specific uh, cognitive science tells us how humans become literate with a specific focus training and decoding, with a broadening of their vocabulary base. This is what we have focused on in Texas in a major way to make sure that we are equipping our teachers with the skills that they need to be successful with our kids. Um, it, is, it is a tremendous commitment to our teachers um, in making sure that we are pursuing the most effective pra practices for kids. We have also, in Texas, in the height of the pandemic, the legislature uh, met and reflected on what are, the, what are the key components that we need to equip ourselves to better serve students coming out of the pandemic. And we know that tutoring works. So the legislature enacted, basically gave a new right to every parent and teacher in the state of Texas that you have the right to, to dedicated tutoring all school year if you are below grade level. And it's going to be focused and evidence-based, um, oriented around a bunch of uh, national large-scale studies. Now, these things aren't easy, by the way. 
Uh, it is not easy to invest in a years-long fellowship uh, of, of evidence-based literacy practices. It is not easy to guarantee kids access to skilled and, and, um, and targeted tutoring. But the evidence speaks for itself. It is clearly the right thing to do. And many, many states did not make these kinds of commitments, and they do not see the same gains for their kids. Similarly, last but not least, an investment in curricular rigor. Our kids are reading content. We want to make sure that that is engaging, that that is, that is uh, growing their vocabulary, that it is rich. Uh, that is what uh, we, as, as, I, as a dad, want my kids to learn while they're in school. So we made significant investments in curricular rigor all over the state of Texas. Again, these are unique features of the policy landscape affecting schools all over the state of Texas. The thing is, I'm not at just any school in the state of Texas. Um, we can talk about this policy and see the impact that it has on schools system-wide, but we are here in Klein ISD talking about one niche elementary for a reason. Klein ISD, it should be worth noting, has experienced unparalleled growth in both achievement and longitudinal student growth for kids. This is extraordinary. It is an outlier. It is cause for celebration. It is cause for class. <laughs> We went from uh, nine campuses that were A-rated pre-pandemic to 15 campuses A-rated post-pandemic. Uh, not a single D or F campus before, not a single D or F, not rated campus this year. The, the level of performance improvement is uh, extraordinary. And that doesn't just happen, folks. It happens because you have extraordinarily skilled leadership here locally. That is not just doing, that is not doing what is popular, they're not deliberately unpopular, they're doing what is right. Uh, they're, they are, they're saying this is what the evidence tells us. Um, so you can have all your hot sports opinions all you want, but we are going to do what our kids require us to do, we are going to be focused. We are going to manage with love and compassion because this is what schools do, but we are going to manage with high expectations and with evidence. And it's, it's incredible uh, when you see the growth of climb. But let's talk about niche in particular. And I'll, I'll do a little my best fan of white here. Turn around. <laughs> uh, niche elementary. <laughs> the level of performance gain at niche is truly extraordinary. Um, the school went from a 71 pre-pandemic to a 95 today. Uh, <laughs> And uh, you may remember a little earlier, I talked about the sort of the, the specific ways that we evaluate performance. We evaluate it based upon achievement. We evaluate it based upon growth. We evaluate it based on closing the gaps. You're seeing double-digit gains across the board in every way that a school can perform. This school does perform for its students. Yeah. It is. Yeah. <laughs> If you look at the increase in student achievement, remember student achievement is what the kids know or can do, not just how much they grew in a year, but what can they know, what can they do. This school had the third highest increase in student achievement of all elementary schools in the state of Texas. Wow. It is, uh, it is extraordinary what has been demonstrated here. Niche Elementary is only one of eight high poverty elementary schools in the state of Texas to go from zero distinctions to all of them. Um, <laughs> just in case you're curious, a distinction designation, uh, you earn that because you are distinct. This is a very important thing. This is, a, this is, this is high, levels, high levels of performance. So, I thought uh, I would uh, ask maybe those potentially most directly responsible to come and reflect on this last year. So if I can, turn over to Dr. McGowan. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Commissioner Marath, for coming back to Klein ISD. We are so proud in this moment. And I just want to uh, say, gosh, Commissioner Marath, I want to apologize because when this man called me to tell me the great news about this school, I am pretty sure I blew out his eardrum. I was so <laughs> excited about what is happening here at Niche Elementary. And so pleased to see the hard work of so many talented educators who have sacrificed tremendously 
for the boys and girls of Klein ISD, and particularly here today at Niche Elementary, to see the spotlight of success shine on them. It is well deserved. So I do want to start today with just a few words of gratitude for all of you who made time to come and celebrate this accomplishment with us. You know, there is nothing better than seeing people you care about succeed. And the bottom line is we could not have achieved this success today in Klein ISD or at Niche Elementary without a community that puts their arms around us and helps us to excel for our students. So first, I want to say thank you to all of our elected officials who took the time to be here today and particularly to to the members of the Texas Legislature. Thank you so much for your service, for coming and being in our schools. Thank you for all the things you do for the great state of Texas and all the things you're going to do in this next legislative session <laughs> to support the hardworking educators who serve over five million students in the great state of Texas. We appreciate it. And truly, when I look at Senator Betancourt and Representative Harless, you all are true friends to Klein ISD. Thank you so much for all the ways you celebrate with us, not just in these big moments, but along the way. We are grateful for your partnership. Right here at home, we are so fortunate to have the absolute best, exceptional team of community leaders, and that is our locally elected Klein ISD Board of Trustees. They are the absolute best school board anywhere in the world. I call them the Magnificent Seven. Uh, because they are honorable, thoughtful, competent, courageous servant leaders who do what is right by kids, who model what it looks like for individuals with diverse perspectives and experiences to unite in their purpose. And that's just to make sure that every student in Klein ISD receives an excellent education. And so uh, they are very humble people. They are not doing this for recognition and they don't get a paid a penny for the critical work they do for Klein ISD. But it would not be possible to celebrate today if it was not for the leadership of Ronnie Anderson, Rob Alice, Kathy Erlano, Doug James, Dustin Krieger, Chris Todd, and Georgianne Reitmeyer. So please give our <laughs> I read this morning that from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so I want my heart to share words of gratitude and to speak those words of gratitude over the Klein family. And that's the 7,000 employees of Klein ISD who make the magic happen for our kids every single day. From our remarkable teachers to our counselors, school leaders, district support staff, to the cafeteria crew, the custodians, the bus drivers, we know that it takes every one of us showing up every single day, giving everything we have to deliver on our promise to every single student. The last few years have brought unprecedented challenges. And amidst all the trials, what I have seen firsthand is a relentless commitment to our kids, an unwavering dedication to standing in the gap between our students' promise and their purpose. When a large district like Klein ISD can start a new school year, with 99% of all teacher vacancies filled when many school districts are struggling to find great people to be in our classrooms. We know that we have something special in our Klein family, and I could not be more proud of or grateful for all of you. Please give these hardworking teachers support. <laughs> given the great privilege to become the superintendent of Klein ISD, there was a vacancy for the principalship of Niche Elementary. At that time, and I know there are many of us who have known this school for many years, Niche was a school that struggled. It struggled to consistently perform academically. It struggled to believe that better outcomes for students were possible. It struggled to adequately support the hardworking teachers in the trenches who were giving their best every single day for our kids. I called up our board president at the time, Ms. Georgian Reitmeyer, and I said, Georgian, you're going to need to trust me on this one. And I reminded her that's where the word trust in trustee comes into play. <laughs> I said, I am tired of the endless triage at Niche Elementary, and I want to see this school completely healed. I believe it can be a bright light in our community for what is possible when we are relentless in our belief that every student can learn at high levels and we are willing to do the hard work to make it happen. Enter into the story, Mr. Frank Ward. Mr. Ward was just minding his own business in another part of Klein ISD when I gave him a call. I described the mission and I asked him to lead Niche Elementary. Thankfully for the kids and the teachers and the families at Niche Elementary, Frank slept on it, <laughs> called me the next day to accept the mission, and 
things have never been the same here since. No doubt, thoughtfully disrupting the status quo and writing a new story of hope and possibility at Niche has not been easy for Frank and his team. There have been long days and sleepless nights and far too many examples looming in the back of folks' minds of how kids in schools like Niche, where nearly all of the schools live in poverty, are destined to be educated in struggling schools. But today, Niche is no longer part of that tired narrative. Not only did the amazing educators and families and kids at Niche Elementary succeed in the state accountability system, earning that overall A, a perfect score of 100 in closing learning gaps, and all six distinctions, but in multiple system measures and indicators of success, including teacher retention, family satisfaction, and nationally normed student achievement data. The Niche students, staff, and community are far better off today than they were in 2019. Or, as one of our third grade teachers at Niche simply summed it up, hard work pays off, my heart is super happy. <laughs> Leadership is the game changer in writing a better story for our kids. So please join me in welcoming the Klein ISD Elementary Principal of the Year, the difference maker in our midst, Niche Elementary Principal, Mr. Frank Ward. <laughs> this day happened at Niche Elementary. This morning when they asked me if I had a speech to put into the notebook, I reached into my pocket and said, I have this sticky note that I can then use, because that's how we do it at an elementary school. We have sticky notes, and we put sticky notes everywhere. So with this little sticky note, I'll begin with the, the conversation that Dr. McGowan talked about uh, three years ago. She sent a message to me saying, uh, Frank, I have this idea. Contact me. And I thought, an idea. <laughs> what could she possibly mean? So I spent the rest of the afternoon uh, thinking through what has happened these last few months. I knew there were a few openings in the district and I knew that Niche was one of them, and I knew that the campus that I was currently at was a very high-performing school. Uh, uh, we'd had our challenges. We did not begin as a high-performing school, but the last three or four years, we were doing extremely well and did not have to work extremely hard because the system and the process was in place. So when she called me, I thought to myself, it has something to do with me leaving this school. And it's <laughs> one of those two. So when I went to, went to meet with her, we spoke about the school, she talked about the progress, and then she mentioned niche. And I thought to myself, can, can I really do that? Because niche has some serious, serious deficits. Um, and I know that my school that I'm at now, we grew to this point, but the deficits were not quite that serious. So I was prepared to give her an answer, even though all of those things were going through my mind. However, uh, she said, sleep on it. But as I was walking out, I thought to myself, uh, as I always tell my staff, guess what? It's not about you. It's not really about you. It's about the kids and what we need to do for the kids. So before I even reached my car, really, I had decided, well, I'm going to pack up my things tomorrow <laughs> and put them in the box and slyly move everything out so that when we make the announcement, all I have to do is get my keys and go. <laughs> um, so I called her back, and yes, I agreed that I would come to Niche Elementary, the smartest decision I ever made in my life was deciding to come to Niche Elementary. <laughs> Right now, uh, as we stand here celebrating Niche's past success, right now, all around us, literally we're surrounded by it. Students are in their classrooms at this very moment learning all of the things that they need to learn for the start of the year. They're going through that righteous struggle so that on the very end they can have that achievement. Because our teachers now understand what the mission is. 
and we speak about the mission all the time. I put it in the emails. When we have professional developments, I talk about the mission. When we get together, I talk about the mission, the mission, the mission. And it's not the mission statement that we all, uh, those of us in education, know so well that we get together in our professional developments, we write these big long mission statements, they have all the vocabulary in them, <laughs> um, and it takes three or four days to write uh, a four or five paragraph mission statement. That is not the mission I'm speaking of. The mission I'm speaking of is making sure that every day we show up for every child. And when I say every, I mean every. I get on my high horse about this all of the time with the staff. Every means every. Every means every. Some days they're welcoming of every. Other days we're challenged by every. But every day, every child, we have to show up for them. Here, here. <laughs> Ron has multiple pathways uh, that open multiple doors and opportunities for our students, but it is our job through our mission to make sure that we have those doors open for our students. When they leave Niche Elementary and head next door or wherever they head off to, those doors should be open to them because that is our charge, making sure we take care of the mission and our every. So I cannot let this day pass because I have had some extraordinary staff. I have some extraordinary teachers. These kids, they understand that not every day can be a play day. They understand that in order to achieve, you have to put in the work, you have to set a goal, you have to monitor your goal. The kids will stop us in the hallway and say, I met my goal, wonderful, what is your goal for the next one? <laughs> so each time they're setting goals. But today I want to really thank my staff, the families that support us in getting the kids to school, and most particularly my two compadres that have been with me through the ups and the downs. Trina Grice. And Mr. Neil Cassidy. Ups and downs, all arounds. We spend lots of time in the afternoon planning, replanning, reassessing making sure that it happens for niche, and also debating who's better, Monica or Brandy. <laughs> we all have our distinct things. I think we finally landed on the answer, but I'm not sure they really agreed when they just kind of went with it. But thank all of you for coming to celebrate niche today, and this isn't the end of the story. There's more to come. Thank you. <laughs>
is up on the screen. Well, while that's happening, so they, um, uh, again, we provide, yes, sir. We have multiple members of the Appropriations Committee here today. Schools.gov, where you can at home, parents can browse and review this information. Uh, our educators can browse, teachers, principals, um, uh, board members, and others to reflect on performance. So, for example, if we type in, uh, just pull a school at random here, um, uh, niche uh, metric, um, you can see all of the information about niche uh, that, uh, that a parent or an educator might want to reflect on. So, what is our overall level of performance? Um, what are some uh, enrollment statistics about the campus? Uh, what are some staffing statistics about the campus? They do believe in their staff here at Klein ISD and they put their money where their mouth is. Um, uh, you will notice uh, the distinction designations that are possible to earn, and lo and behold, they've all been filled in here at Niche. Uh, so, uh, outstanding. <laughs> you, can, um, you can also search for schools uh, geographically. So, if you want to pull up a map, I'll uh, pull up our address at. Um, uh, at TEA headquarters here and uh, sort of zoom in. You'll notice you've got a, a map and I can, I can zoom in more closely on this to kind of look um, in and around campuses. You got ABCs, not rated. So you can click on any one of the campuses and learn about that one campus in particular. If I want to just look for say high schools, I can filter down to grade nine and, uh, and then it will show me all of the high schools that are in the area. So we want to make this information as easy as possible for the taxpaying public who are paying for these uh, schools, for parents who are uh, want to advocate for the best in the best interest of their kids, for principals uh, to reflect on performance, teachers to reflect on performance, all of this information available at their fingertips. And again, this uh, the existence of this resource, the existence of the uh, supportive uh, funds and policies that we have in the state of Texas, really comes from pretty extraordinary state leadership that is focused on just what kids need. When I think about the leadership again of, of um, Governor Abbott, of Lieutenant Governor Patrick, of Speaker Phelan, and of the leaders that we have here in the room, one in, uh, in particular, if I don't know if you all are cold call you here, but um, the, um, it's always, uh, might have run this past them in advance, but, the, um, but uh, we have one of the architects of Senate Bill 1365, which is the reason we've made certain adjustments to the accountability system coming out of COVID, is none other than local Senator uh, uh, Paul Betancourt. So I don't know if Senator Betancourt, you'd like uh, to speak about some of the successes that you've seen here um, and the policies that you've been able to enact in Austin. I'd like to ask my three colleagues to join me, Sam, Brandon, and, and Harold, okay, to come on up too as well. Uh, because as principal author of Senate Bill 1365, that restored the A through F ranking system. And why did I try to do it as much as I could to restore it? Because what gets measured gets fixed. Now here at each elementary, it's not just fixed, okay? Principal Frank and the compadres, okay? <laughs> All right, when you look at this, these are incredible scores. They're not just distinguished, Mike, okay? As, you know, as, as a guy that's, that's, you know, bound to be hyperbole, it's great! It's unbelievable! Stand up! time, Chairman Grayton, a year because they may not be able to get it done. But not here in need. This is incredible. Okay? 
look at this inform look at this, Chairman Dutton. Okay, over here. <laughs> 93, okay, look at this last line. Okay, this is on closing the gap. In a COVID year, we're nationally, we're in an education chasm. It's horrible. The education system has nearly been knocked off flat on its, you know what, as an Aggie, it's right back here, okay? <laughs> this school powers through, Jenny, okay? And you've got an incredible superintendent, okay? Yes. Give her a big hand. Yeah. And Frank, you would have gotten a raise if you'd been number one or two out of 4,500. <laughs> I mean, we'll get back to that later, okay? The money went to the compadres. I don't know. <laughs> but it's because of you know Sam Harless voting for this. I mean, this was not easy. This it took three tries to get this bill. Okay, two in the House, and finally the Senate version actually came through. But it's so important that you be able to see the results, that the public see it, the kids see it, the teachers see it. Everybody knows the sense of accomplishment in this area because we don't have that slide up. But this is an 88.7% economic disadvantaged group. That makes this even more astonishing. Three out of 4,500 schools, and it's an 88.7% economic disadvantaged area. Don't tell me this type of success is not achievable, because it is achievable. And that's exactly what Senate Bill 1365 was about. That's why we fought to restore the A through F ranking, because we had a, we had a court of criminal, well, not criminal court appeals, but it should have been criminal, okay? <laughs> you know, take away that ranking system. But it's so important to see this success, because what gets measured gets fixed, except when it's distinguished and when it's great, everybody hears about it, because these best practices now have to be exp exported because Jenny is this close to an A rating for this district, okay? Incredible, incredible ratings anyway already because of the improvements. One more year of improvement like this, this, this school district is gonna be nationally recognized for what's already happening here today. It's the compadre's job and the teachers to make sure it keeps going because it's the mission that counts, the mission of educating every child. And I can't do it without people like this because that's how I get votes, all right? And it's bipartisan when we fight these issues because it's not about politics. It's about what's best for kids in Texas, all right? I want to thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being here to celebrate the great performance at Ninja <laughs> uh, Appreciate the Course Correction Center. And um, uh, I think with that, we have a few uh, minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Um, first of all, congratulations, Nick. Amazing achievement. Um, there are parents that are going to be watching this, and, and they'll see their schools or their districts under the not rated category, and that will be concerning to them. So can you please just explain why, um, according to Senate Bill, We do try to provide transparent information to parents on where the performance landed. What we also, um, uh, the, the formal infrastructure of the law ties that into interventions from TEA. So what this allows us to do is to provide technical assistance, targeted grant funds to help improve performance in those schools, but not necessarily tie into formal um, sanctions or other interventions that, that TEA um, uh, might otherwise um, be required to administer. So this does allow the degree of support for the school while providing, again, uh, more room for the, for the campus to continue to improve as we recover from COVID. So it, it essentially gives schools the chance to catch up it, it, from COVID instructions and whatever else was before. That's, uh, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. It, uh, it does allow for um, local leadership then to, to uh, make the necessary investments to improve over time. It gives schools a chance to catch up. And will this only be one year, so next year will schools can resume those C, uh, D, or F rates? Yes, uh, as the architect of Senate Bill 1365 established, the, the, it is only this one year coming out of COVID where there's not rated for DNF. Next year, the uh, full system returns. Commissioner, you, you talked at length about teachers, how not just anybody can do
do it and the investment needed. How do you uh, close the gap given the shortage of teachers across the state, uh, particularly in districts that don't necessarily have the resources to pay? Yeah, so the, uh, what is, I, I think, a, a truism in public education, but of course the data shows this is the single most important in-school factor that infects the lives of our students is the teacher in the classroom. So our uh, strategic priorities as an agency, the, um, the, the legislature's focus, is first and foremost on recruiting, supporting, and retaining uh, teachers and principals. It, it, we have got to be relentless at it. We actually have more teachers employed in the state of Texas than in every other state in the country, including California. We have more teachers currently employed in, uh, in Texas than we ever have before. And what we also have more openings than we ever have before. It's kind of a weird um, uh, a paradox, as it were. And this is in part due to the influx of resources that the legislature has authorized as part of our COVID recovery. We put, plugged in $20 billion of extra funds to support public education in Texas. This, that's allowed for the creation of a lot more teaching positions. But teachers are not, um, you don't become a teacher overnight. This is something that, that takes skill and study and practice. Um, it is uh, a pretty uh, tremendous. A, a, a brain surgeon who is responsible for molding minds you get the benefit of working with one patient at a time and they're under anesthesia. So the, the, the teaching, uh, uh, teaching work is extremely difficult. And so what we have done is we've made significant investments in educator preparation and in the pipeline into um, uh, becoming a teacher. We've made significant investments in our school districts and what they are doing to fully staff their campuses all over the state of Texas. And this has been done equitably. So when you think about, you asked as part of your question is, that school districts that may or may not have the same uh, level of resources. If you look at the way that public school is funded in the state of Texas, money follows the, the, uh, the children, and in fact, the money is very equitably distributed. So there's vastly more um, funds provided where there's, for example, higher levels of economically disadvantaged kids than others. And so school districts around the state of Texas have essentially a level playing field with regard to funds that they receive. And so what we then try to do is equip uh, local leaders with as much flexibility and technical assistance as possible to fill those gaps. So how do you retain them, especially those who are certified to teach some of the more difficult classes? Well, I mean, uh, uh, teacher retention comes down to a variety of things, but at its core, it's going to be working conditions, pay. Uh, these, these, these factors, we have, you know, we've got to make sure that we have organized the profession so that uh, the work that our teachers do uh, can be done thoughtfully, can be done with some amount of downtime. Uh, uh, being a teacher is an extremely difficult pr uh, profession. It requires the most cognitive skill, the most passion, uh, the most energy. But we have got to do um, a more in terms of equipping our teachers with effective curricular resources so they don't necessarily have to uh, uh, scour the internet to find uh, materials for uh, teaching kids. We provide solid training and we provide effective reflection time during the school day um, for them to uh, hone in on the craft and time for them to call parents um, uh, to review and reflect on assessment results. So this work of improving the working conditions for our teachers is critical, making sure that we support a positive disciplinary environment um, uh, similarly critical. And this is all part of the work that we do both strategically as an organization at TEA and major investments that the legislature has under multiple bills um, to improve the, the professional supports that we offer to teachers. Why is the STAR test the best way to measure growth and improvement and achievement? Uh, we, it's, so one thing to bear in mind is there's multiple ways to measure how well students learn. Uh, uh, humans are fairly complicated, <laughs> as if you're a dad, you will certainly recognize this. The, um, uh, and, and so we need to actually embrace multiple ways uh, to as assess where our, thank you, sir, uh, assess where our students are and how well they are learning. The STAR test is the only assessment that has been built to align to our state content standards. So when you think about the curriculum that every school has to cover and that has to be covered in, uh, in all, for all kids regardless of their background, the STAR test is the only test that's explicitly designed to measure that, uh, that statewide curriculum uh, that happens. And then we report on it in common ways so you can see an apples to apples comparison uh, about how individual kids are, are performing and, and, how, uh, and how schools are performing. As a dad, because I'm not just a commissioner of education, so I get uh, four young kids, so I look at my kids' own uh, report card uh, uh, results, but I also this year looked at their star scores at the end of the year, and I could see some gaps, I could see what the curriculum was covered, and then I can use that information um, to support my kid um, as a dad. Last other, question. other, other questions maybe from other individuals? Before we well good okay Tom last one go sure I'm, yes, I'm the kid in the back of the class yes sir of course, of course. Yeah, yeah yeah the the bell's already gone off you're keeping us off from lunch yeah. uh, 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 school safety certainly on the top of everybody's 
course. This year too. Can you talk about the safety audits that are going on around the state? Yeah, so uh, every school in the state, and you can uh, certainly, Dr. McGowan can attest to this, we have inspected, we collectively, public education has inspected every exterior door to make sure it's functioning, it closes, it locks. We've gone through our access control procedures. We want to make sure people are coming to the, to the known visitor area and there's not unauthorized access um, in uh, different entrances. That we are uh, ensuring that we are training staff on necessary safety drills top to bottom in every school in the state before school starts and that for staff, staff that are involved in reviewing individual behavior of students that might be threatening, that those staff get special training on how to then intervene so that we can prevent those, um, uh, escal those, those threats from escalating into something more significant. So that is happening across all 9,000 campuses, all 1,200 school systems all over the state of Texas. Um, in addition, the legislature is, uh, is, is evaluating um, in, in every uh, available option to make sure that we have the safest school environment for all of our kiddos um, all over the state of Texas. I'm on the Protect All Texas committee. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's yeah. a, there's a senatorial, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm on the Protect All uh, Texans committee. There's going to be a series of reports coming out. The House has already released a preliminary report. They'll have it finalized and there'll be a, a major report from the Senate on specifically on school safety. And those will help certainly longer term actions, but there has been immediate steps taken to ensure that safety is top of mind in every school um, and that we have the, the effective procedures to ensure that both our students and our staff are safe um, in, in every public school in Texas. Time for one more? Anybody? All right. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.